our political analyst, Bob Beatles. Hello, Michelle. How are you today? Great. How are you doing? Good so far. Thank you. Yeah, I've been missing you. Yes, I, I've heard that. Yeah, I've been driving by all the time, and my car just keeps going right by you. Yeah, oh, well. <laughs> One of these days, I'll get out there for you. Yeah. Did you get a chance to read the book? Yes, I did. It was a very interesting book. It is. It is. A Hundred Things to Do in Detroit Before You Die. It's kind of like a bucket list. It's written by Amy Eckert, and she took the time, and she actually writes for a lot of different areas, Cuba, and has um, helped do some Harley Davidson road trip books. So with that being said, Bob, what's on your bucket list? Oh, to go see Bamberg, Germany again. The, they pronounce it Bamberg. Uh, uh, visit Virginia Beach, uh, College Park, Maryland, where I went to school, places like that. Uh, well, maybe there we are a can. Of places. Maybe we can talk to Amy, and she could write a book about everywhere you want to go. That way, you're prepared when you get there. Hey, that's a good idea. That's not a bad idea. Yes. Yep. Very good idea. I think uh, my bucket list. I have a lot of restaurants. There's a lot oh, of different food out there. There are oh, there are a lot of good restaurants. Yes. And I like jumping out of a plane. So anywhere I can do that. I yeah, that's not on my list. <laughs> Come on, Bob. Maybe one day. Eh? Yeah. Okay. You too. All right. Well, I'm excited for the show, and we will be right back after this.
glad you're here. Your book, A Hundred and Things to Do Detroit Before You Die. Yes. How long did it take you to write that? Well, I like to say it took me about two months to write and about 20 years to research. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been a freelance writer for about 20 years now and have always uh, written about Detroit. It's always been a city that has been near and dear to me since I was born there and uh, is a destination I have frequently written about. So when I had the opportunity to write 100 Things to Do in Detroit, it really didn't take too long to come up with a list because I already felt like I knew the city quite well. Question, when, when did you write the book, or when did you publish the book? The book was published uh, a little less than a year ago, last oh. spring. So it's been around for several months now. We really um, um, hit the bookstores hard in the fall, and um, I've been seeing great success with it. So. Well, it's fresh, and it's, it it's a it great is. travel guide. It is. That, the idea is that uh, people maybe who've never been to Detroit before have a good starting point of, of you know, the must-see things to, to do in the city, places like the Motown Museum or the DIA or the Detroit Zoo. But then also for those who maybe feel like they already know Detroit pretty well, I tried to include some of the sites that are a little more off the beaten path or sites that are new and of course you well know there are plenty of new things to see and do in Detroit these days. Well there was one restaurant in particular that just closed. It's in your book. It was the Renaissance Center. Oh on yes. Top of there. I know. It did. Well that's the danger with including restaurants in a book is they sometimes come and go. Another favorite that's in the book in the Corkdown section is Katoy which was a real favorite of mine, and, um, and they apparently recently had a fire. So these things happen. But, but it's on your bucket list, so you accomplished it. It is on my bucket it. list, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I've tried to divide the book up by neighborhoods so that if maybe a single restaurant is no longer there or maybe doesn't suit your fancy, you'll find others in the neighborhood that will. Well, so you do restaurants, you cover yes. museums, entertainment. Yes. Yep. I divided the book into five sections, uh, food and drink, uh, shopping, sports and recreation, art and culture, and history. And so if you've got a particular area of interest, you can pretty quickly find your way to a site that will appeal to you. Uh, and then in the back of the book, I also have itineraries based on particular themes. There's a, a list of things to see and do if you like automotive history. There are a list of things to see and do if you're really interested in music or if you want to do things that are fun with the kids or fun on a date. And uh, so I tried to make the list a little more approachable in breaking it up that way. I, I enjoyed the book. I mean, I, I love Detroit. You know, you were born yeah. and raised in Detroit yeah. I, um, in the country outside, but we went there and we got to experience some plays and some restaurants and entertainment and of course sporting events and it's nice to see all the good parts about Detroit because Detroit is yeah. so renowned for being a dirty evil off type of city that most people are scared of yeah I I guess I personally have never quite understood that I mean in, in any big city you have neighborhoods that are uh, maybe less desirable than others but I, I've always seen a really interesting um, creative and industrious side to the city. I think the people in Detroit are hard to beat. They're some of the friendliest you'll find anywhere in the world. Um, Detroit's art and culture and food are, are like none other, but you, you'd have to admit in the last five years or so since the city has begun its renaissance, there have just been more and more really interesting, cool, fun things to do, in, particularly in downtown and midtown and in Corktown than um, probably in my lifetime. Another classic of mine, of course, since uh, I come from a farming family, uh -huh. the Detroit Eastern Market. Now that's oh, a village all in itself. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic place to go if you want to shop for food or um, buy cut flowers, that kind of thing. But the other thing I love about Eastern Market is that it's surrounded by shops and restaurants and coffee shops as well. So you can go to the market and buy goodies, buy items for dinner if you are local. Pretty much anything. It, 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 pretty much anything, yeah. And then you can stay and have dinner or coffee or uh, do a little souvenir shopping in the outer edges. It, it's usually a full day to get through the whole market if you're going to do it right. It's one of yeah. the largest in the nation and one of the oldest, yeah. And they have that flower day. Yes. Which is huge. Yes. Hundreds of thousands of people attend that. 
one Sounds day. Sounds pretty appealing <clears throat> in the springtime, doesn't it? All those flowers blooming. If you're wanting to plant your garden, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Have you been to, what's your favorite place that you'd found in the book, Bob? Well, there are a lot of interesting places I read about in there. I've been through Detroit uh, and around Detroit, but I, I couldn't recognize the places from the book hmm. because I, I, you know, if I stopped somewhere, I'd just stop and then I didn't try to remember the name or anything like that. Although with reading the book, I found the, the uh, one of the names very uh, intriguing. The Third Man is the place that makes vinyl records and, uh, you know, that's the name of a movie and the Third Man theme was a popular uh, uh, tune. But uh, I was surprised for a place in Detroit to have that name. Yeah, well, Third Man Record Shop is uh, is Jack White's record store, and right. Jack White is a local local boy, and um, he uh, made his uh, claim to fame with the White Stripes, and um, yeah, he just within the last couple of years opened this record shop in Midtown area, and also has a vinyl pressing plant in the back of that. It's a really fun place to go if you like vinyl, and there are a lot of other cool music um, items there, music memorabilia, and of course. Um, shirts and items related to the white stripes, so that's fun. Bob, I have to ask, do you still have a record player? No. No? No. Oh, I, don't don't. Even, I don't have a CD player anymore. I used to, but I... Well, you know, uh, vinyl's I, coming back. Hmm? I've heard vinyl is coming back, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's, uh, what was the first record you ever bought? Who? Uh, Dave Clark Five? <laughs> no, the Beatles. The Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> was it hard to limit to a hundred different it was. places? It was very difficult to limit myself to a hundred, uh, but I wanted, I really wanted a nice mix of old and new, classic and contemporary, um, a nice mix of museums and restaurants and bars, and so I, I had to do a little picking and choosing, and um, yeah. Because I'm quite certain people have been to Detroit and they're, well, she didn't put this in the book, she didn't put that in the book, but 100 things, that's a lot to do. It is, 100 is a lot to do and... Um, I mean, I might have completed a handful, I gotta get busy. Yeah, <laughs> start checking them off as you go yeah, through. My and... bucket's feeling a little empty after reading <laughs> that book. <laughs> You know, and I was wondering, 
when you wrote the book, I'm sure you went to each and every place and you've yeah. experienced each event. You yeah. just didn't write about it because you heard about it. Right, that's very important to me to, to have first-hand experience with the places I write about. Um, you know, it, it's difficult to really get a sense of a hotel unless you've stayed the night there. It's hard to get a sense of a restaurant unless you've eaten a meal there. Um, it's key to me, it's really how I've, uh, how I've worked my whole career to not just to write about things that I've heard about or that people say good things about, but places that I have first-hand knowledge of so that I can write more authentically. I think that's important. Yeah. From the author world, is that a tax write-off? Well, Yes, it is. It's it is. Fine it's line. expensive doing business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're not vacations when I take uh, trips to research the books that I work on, whether it's the Detroit book or um, the Cuba book or uh, Europe by Rail. Um, those are all research trips that I've taken that are pretty heavily focused on seeing and doing the sites that I'm interested in writing about. I typically don't travel with family or friends. I usually go on my own and um, and um, have a very strict itinerary that I follow so I can make sure I've got everything covered. Um, I, I still like to travel for vacation and I do that, but the, for the most part, the travel that I am engaged in is um, pretty fast paced and pretty disciplined. So you've written other books of travel prior mm -hmm. to coming out with the 100 yes. things to do in Detroit. What yeah. made you come back to home? What made you decide? Uh, well, you know, I think I think, to be honest, the, there is just an, an interest in the city of Detroit right now, an intensity of focus on the city of Detroit. People across the nation and around the world have heard that there's a renaissance in Detroit and that there are things to see and do here that, um, that are worth taking time for, that there's a, a unique culture in Detroit that maybe they didn't recognize before. And so really, the 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 reason that I wrote the book about Detroit now is that there are so many people who want to know what the city is about and what they should see and do when they come. And it's evolving too. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, a year from now we'll be talking about the D District Detroit with the new Little Caesars Arena and all of, there'll be 50 blocks of new development you're going to have to write a new book. in the District of Detroit. Exactly, yes, yes. And the Joe Lewis, I mean, that's a key part of Detroit's culture right now. But a year from now, the Joe Lewis will be dark. So, um, you know, it's a city that's evolving. Um, who knows what the Q line, the new streetcar system will do to develop the city along Woodward Avenue. Um, so, yes, it's an evolving city. It's a really exciting time for Detroit and Detroiters. And for people who love Detroit, um, lots of reasons to come back and... Um, and check out what's new. So within five years, we'll be able to look for a hundred things to do in Detroit Volume Two. Right? Yes, yes, I think so. I'm I excited. That's a safe bet. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, with all the investigative approach that you took to do your book, tell me some of the exciting. St I'm sure there's some stories you can tell about interesting people and things that you've ran into. Oh, you know, I feel that every time I come to the city, I meet interesting people. I, I think that Detroiters are a big part of what makes Detroit so special. But I, I did run into some surprises. I um, had not been to the Ford Paquette plant before when I before writing this book. And so I took the opportunity to check that place out. It's a fairly recently um, revitalized factory that Henry Ford built his first Model T's in. And um, it's only been open to the public for a few years, but it, it fascinated me to see this little, it, it's a fairly small building. It's the building where the Model T was born, but you could say in many ways, it was the place where Detroit, where the Motor City was born. Absolutely. That's where the, the automobile really got its start, and this predates assembly line days. So that was a surprise to me to find that, um, that museum. I. I didn't know it existed and had never been. Um, you know, many of the shops in mid in Midtown, I, I'd driven past them before, mm -hmm. but had never really had the opportunity to go in and check them out. And um, it was surprising to me to see the the wealth of items sold, but also just the the entrepreneurial spirit in all of these um, um, shops as well. You know, a lot of people left Detroit when. That when times got bad, but those who stayed really believed in the city, and they were the ones who helped revitalize the city when it um, came to its rebirth. So, 
a lot of these restaurants and shops are entrepreneurial owned and they're owned by people who really care about their neighborhoods. So how was your research decided? Did you just go driving in Detroit and you decided to pull over and go into this shop? Or was it word of mouth, things you've heard of, things oh, you've always wanted to do? Yeah, word of mouth. Um, the internet, I read reviews, I get um, emails about new uh, hotels and restaurants that are opening. Um, I've worked very closely over the years with the Detroit Convention and Visitors Bureau. So they'll let me know when there's a new development, a new museum, a new restaurant. Um, they'll send me emails and notices. And so I use a lot of different resources, but word of mouth is a big one. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes you just have to poke around on your own. You see some place uh -huh. that looks interesting. You think, hmm, well. So is your book at the tourism office? It, yep. The, the Convention and Visitors Bureau has been a huge supporter of my book. It's sold at a number of Detroit themed shops like the Detroit Shop and Pure Detroit and all of the big bookstores carry it as well. So. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. How, how did you go about organizing this book? Well, I divided it by, um, by themes, um, by museums and art and culture and sports and so on. And then um, within each of those categories, I tried to, I tried to create a nice mix of classic, um, classic sites that perhaps longtime Detroiters are well aware of and intersperse those with some new ones or, or some sites that are off the beaten path. I tried to make it a book that was that's easy to page through. Each page has just a, a couple hundred words, so it doesn't take too long to read each one. Um, each listing has a little bit of the history of how the site was was started, if if that was available to me. It, I liked how it was I very much liked how it was organized. I thought it was well Thank done, you. and it Thank wasn't you. too wordy. So if you're interested in going any place, you you pick up the book and you can use it actually as a travel yeah. guide. It tells yeah. you where, it tells you hours, it tells you price. Yeah, it, it can be easy for a writer to get wordy, too wordy. Mm -hmm. And that isn't always the best way to write a book that is traveler friendly. When you're on the road, you, you don't want to read a whole chapter about the DAA. You just want the highlights. You want to know, you know roughly when it was started and what it's famous for and what you can't miss when you get there. And so I tried to stick to those basics. I've uh, mentioned that I was going to talk to you and I have a lot of people that are interested in the book and they are actually regular Detroiters and they haven't done half the things so it gives you an idea of what is more out there, where you live. It could be right well, under your nose. I'm really glad to hear that. That was, that was my hope, that this would be a book that would appeal not only to first-time visitors to the city, but to people who've maybe lived here all their lives and just feel that uh, perhaps they haven't seen and done everything there is to, to see and do. So, I know it's not fair to ask you, but out of all the hundred, was there a number one on your list? Not to say that it's going to be on everybody's list, but your personal... Yeah. Uh, I, I don't really have a favorite in the book. Mm. Uh, sometimes I come to the city and I'm really interested in going to a Tigers game. And so, you know, I'll, I'll go to Comerica Park and uh, maybe to the corner, um, the, uh, the corner shop there, the restaurant where the, um, you can look at Tigers memorabilia and eat a burger before the show or before the game. Um, maybe go to Hockey Town for a beer afterwards. Other times I'm coming down for uh, you know, a show at the Fox Theater and then maybe I want a nicer meal. Maybe I'll stay at the Book Cadillac Hotel. And so I don't have a single favorite. Um, I do like to direct people to Corktown because I think that the dining and the bars there are really fun and the atmosphere is cool. And you've got the old Tiger Stadium baseball field there, which for those of us who've been around for a while, that has mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, we have a soft spot Nostalgia. in our for that place. Yeah, right. exactly. Do you, but not do a single favorite. Do you think on volume two, when you come up with volume two, with all the new innovation and everything, the changes going on in Detroit, are you going to be able to come up with a hundred more different things? Or do you think you'll impose some? Well, I think I'll have, I, I think I'll repeat some of the, mm -hmm. some of the things that are in this first book. It's, it's, unimaginable to have a list of 100 things to do that doesn't include the DIA or um, the Motown Museum or the Detroit Zoo. Um, I think those will, for many, many years, be highlights in the city and they'll probably find a place in the second volume as well. Uh, but there will be new things that pop up. As I said, when, you know, when the queue line is up and running and when the new District Detroit is in place, um, 
I don't doubt there will be a good number of new sites worth including in the second volume. Well, as you're talking, I can see how it would be difficult to limit it to 100. Yeah. <clears throat> because, yeah. like I said, there's things that I've done that I've, or places I've been that I've enjoyed that aren't in the book, but you have to cut it somewhere. Right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to try mm -hmm. to include things that appeal to, to families with children, uh, place, people who are uh, maybe in their 20s and 30s and are more interested in clubs and um, and festivals, you know, like the um, Movement Energy Festival and that, that kind of thing. You know, you want to have some younger sites like that as well. So um, You might be able to yeah. steer away and kind of do a book for clubbing, a book for restaurants, a hundred things. Oh, I like the way you think. hundred things That's a great idea, in Detroit actually. before you die. <laughs> That's a great idea, yeah. <laughs> Huh. Well, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, you mentioned Little Caesars, and when Mike Illich died, uh, many of the articles about him had to do with how he was involved in the renaissance of Detroit, and some of the places you mentioned tied right in with that. Um, did that? Uh, did you think about that at uh, when Mike Illich died? How he I, tied into that? I did. I, I um, read quite a bit about Mike Illich after he passed, as I think most of us did, and um, I was surprised to learn that he was really instrumental be behind the rejuvenation of the Fox Theater. I didn't realize that he was the person behind that, but the revitalization of the Fox Theater really helped to. Um, kind of reinvigorate the downtown again. Um, and then, of course, after that, the Comerica Park. And um, I believe the Illiches were also involved in getting the Red Wings moved yeah. from uh, the old Olympia Stadium to the Joe Lewis, which is also downtown. So you've got the Tigers downtown, you've got, you know, uh, the Red Wings downtown, and all of the, you know, all of the activity, all of the money that that brought with it. Um, I think that Mike Illich had a lot of, it takes a lot of credit for rejuvenating the downtown, absolutely. Yes, and then those articles mentioned how the rejuvenation of Detroit has been happening for several years now, and how it's coming back to be the kind of city it was many years ago. Absolutely. It, it's taken a long time, probably longer than most of us realize, because the, the Red Wings came to um, the Joe Lewis in 1979, I think it was. So it's been going on for much longer, and I think, than to, any of us were aware of. A lot of aches and pains along the way. Sure, yeah. And, and Mike Illich may have gotten the name for Little Caesars from the movie, as I recall, Little Caesar, the movie starring Edward G. Robinson, oh. took place in Detroit when Detroit was a really nice place. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I love you, Bob. You're a fountain of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to grow up and be just like you one day. <laughs> You've got a lot of years to go, though. <laughs> oh, just a few, just a few. Well, we have so much to cover today. I want to talk about the other books that you've written and co-written. And, but let's, uh, we'll be right back after this.
welcome back to APM TV Media, your author publisher network. I'm here today with Amy Eckert. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm so glad to be here. And your 100 things to do in Detroit before you die. That's a bucket list if I've ever heard one. It is, yeah. You know, I'm used to communicating with people through my keyboard, so it's kind of fun to have an opportunity to communicate. In person? In person and on television. It's very different for me. Well, I find that hard to believe knowing you've written all these books all over the world that you have a hard time yeah. communicating, but <clears throat> if you can write it, talk it and write it, that's yeah, a heck of an yeah. author. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, sometimes he Pe some people have an easier time communicating um, with their fingers yeah. and others with their voices. But, yeah, I've seen um, some of that finger communication before. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, I would love to talk a little bit. We've talked a lot about Detroit. We could go on all day, I'm quite certain. But you wrote Europe by Rail, USA, and these are books. These are by Frommers, yeah. Frommers Guidebooks. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, Detroit, The 100 Things to Do in Detroit is my most recent book, but it is actually title number 13 or 14 in the list of books that I've contributed to. Amazing. Um, 100 Things Detroit was the first book that I wrote entirely myself, beginning to end. These other books I've contributed to, um, had a hand in, in writing, um, but I've been working on books for a long time. My first um, involvement with writing a book was a little bit daunting. Uh, but you know, when a writer gets involved with a, something like a guidebook, she just kind of divides it up piece by piece, one page at a time, and you know, and before you know it, all the pages add up. So, um, so by the time the Detroit book came along, I felt quite confident mm -hmm. that I could do the whole thing. It's really well written. Now, which was your first first book? Uh, my first book, the first book that I was involved with, actually was the Frommers USA guide, but an earlier edition. This is a, a more recent edition than the first one I worked on, and uh, I wrote the chapter on Detroit in that book, oh. and I also wrote chapters on the Twin Cities in Minnesota and uh, Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. As and well. you've traveled to all these. Yes. Yep. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You are considered a freelance writer. That's right. So for the, since we are Author Publisher Network, for our future authors or present authors watching this show, can you give a little, everyone a little idea how you got started and what well, it entails? Well, I had been a stay-at-home mom for several years and was really kind of itching to get back into the workforce again, but wanted a job that I could really tailor around my kids' school schedules. Mm -hmm. So I had been involved in writing professionally for a long time as a sales and marketing um, uh, manager and it was actually my husband's idea that I investigate getting into freelance writing and travel writing in particular because travel has always been a real passion of mine. I'm just driven to see new places and meet new people so um, so I bought a book called How to Be a Travel Writer and uh, followed the instructions in there and then approached my local newspaper. At that time it was the Holland Sentinel and asked them if I could uh, write some travel material for them uh, just on spec. Mm -hmm. I would write the story up and after they read it and saw it, they could decide if they'd want to run it and pay for it. And that was how, how I got my start. Uh, I kind of leveraged the, the sales that I had in that newspaper into magazine work and eventually into some guidebook work. These days, actually, probably 90% somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of my work is magazine writing. Uh, but I do like to work on books. Books are a little more intense and they are much longer term projects. So, um, so I don't do a book every year. I right. typically work on a book every couple of years. No, you said magazines. What, mag travel magazines? Plus? Yes, yep. Um, I really like travel. That's what in inspires me to write. So I focus almost exclusively on travel, but I've written for Midwest Living, uh, Shape Magazine, Men's Fitness, Hemispheres, which is United Airlines in-flight magazine, Alaska Airlines. Um, I write pretty regularly for the Chicago Tribune now. So, so you write and then you send the writing in and then it's up to them if they want to use it? Is how um, you... the, the tables have turned a little bit now mm -hmm. because I'm more experienced. I have mm -hmm. a little more um, experience on my resume. They contract with me to write the story and we agree on a price in advance. 
and then I write the story to tail tailored to their magazine. The sort of story that I would write for a AAA magazine, for yeah. example, would be very different than the kind of story that I would write for United Airlines or Midwest Living. So it's better for me, easier for me, better for them too, if I know in advance who I'm writing for, who my audience is, and the kinds of um, kinds of issues that that readership is interested in, and then I tailor the story to that magazine right, in that manner. Yeah. Now, with the books, are you contracted to do those because of your resume? Yes. Yep. The same same thing there. Um, the hundred things in to do in Detroit, for example, my most recent book. I was contracted to write that book in advance of writing it because I had a long history of writing about Detroit and a track record. Why should our kids eat healthy? That's a good question. What happens when they don't eat healthy? Well, eating unhealthy leads to an unhealthy life. What can it lead to, you may ask? It can lead to childhood obesity, which leads to diabetes, high blood pressure, and also heart problems. It also can lead to our kids taking medicines at an early age and also extended hospital stays. How can we bring awareness to our kids about childhood obesity? How can we bring awareness to our parents about childhood obesity? Bringing awareness to our kids and their families about childhood obesity helps the whole family Everyone is healthy and everyone is happy. I think I might have a solution. Follow me and let's see. So they were confident before I ever signed the contract that I could do the work that they wanted me to do. It goes to show having a resume as a writer does help. It does. It's like any, any job, I guess. The more experienced you are, the more easily you will be able to sell the, the next job. And um, so I have tried to do that as well. 
started out small, again, you know, in a local newspaper, and then every sale is leveraged for the next sale, and with luck, they will be larger and, um, and you know, more lucrative. Uh, how many years have too. you been doing this, would you say, combined? Yeah, um, probably almost 20 years now. Awesome. Yeah, started out, um, yeah, with newspapers, but it's been almost 20 years now. I, it's hard to believe it's been that long mm -hmm. because it's, uh, well, the time has flown by. It's, it's the perfect job for me. I love being in charge of my own schedule. Um, I love being able to see new parts of the world. It's, it's, an, it's something I'm passionate about anyway. And as they say, the more passionate you are about your work, the less like work the job right, feels. Right. That's a win-win situation. Exactly. Now that yeah. is the art of true writing. Yes, it is. Now, did you visit Cuba to write your book about Cuba? I did, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, I was really fascinated by Cuba, as I think many Americans are, and as I could see that um, our relations were warming up a bit with them, I uh, made, an, made an effort to get down there to, to visit the country before things changed too much. Yes. And, uh, and that was written how long ago? This book was written, uh, gosh, I think it went, it, it was published a, just over a year ago. It okay. was late in 2015 okay. that it was published. And the Germany book? Uh, the Germany book was published right around, uh, it was in the early 2000s. Okay. So that's a few more years old. Now, uh, from an author's standpoint, what's on your bucket list? Oh, well, I really want to get to Vietnam. I'm fascinated by that country. I've had wonderful experiences in Asia and would love to get to Vietnam. I'm interested in cruising there and maybe I'm interested in the street food. I think the, the food would be fascinating. So they're on my list. Uh, I would love to get to Istanbul. That city is fascinating to me because I think it's a, a nice mix of Asia and Europe, both culturally and you know, in terms of food. So that's on my list. Uh, my long time goal, my long term goal is to get to all seven of the continents. Oh. Nine one one. What's your emergency? Yes, I want to report a murder. Oh, but wait, there's eight bodies, not not just one. But I think Bartholomew is going to be upset with me. You know, perhaps I'll get some fresh air and wait on the porch. Tell the ambulance drivers I did my best to clean up. Not all stories have to end this way. It's always how they began that causes the problem. Some parents are kind and loving. Their kids grow up in an environment of respect and encouragement. But some aren't. I hate you. I wish I never had you. You are so damn stupid. You're a waste of life. But one day, regardless of their upbringing, they all grow up and become something. Sometimes they become deadly. So 
so. Now I do have a question for you, and I'm extremely interested. On your book, Bright Atlas of North America, for Harley Davidson, you have to tell me, were you on a motorcycle when you wrote this? Yes, I am. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Fellow Harley owners. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> McNally, and they were putting together this book for Harley Davidson, A Ride Atlas. So it is an atlas of maps, but it also has lists of suggested rides. Yes. Great, great bike rides. Whoa. And I covered, I'm not sure which is in which book. The first and the second edition. Yep. Yeah. And in one book, I covered rides in uh, Michigan and up near Traverse City, mm -hmm. that area, up to the bridge. And I've written about uh, uh, riding in the Florida Keys, which was a fabulous trip, and the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec, uh, the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. The snake? The snake? I did write about the snake, yeah. too, yeah. Although I have to admit, I, I did the snake in a car, so. Oh. Well, I did the snake, and I didn't even know I was doing the snake till I got to the bottom. Uh. And they're like, how'd you like the snake? I'm like, I didn't see a snake. Just, I didn't see a snake. <laughs> it was just a bunch of turns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the Rand McNally, is there restaurants or things or places to stop? Um, in that book, I included places to tank up, places to, um, which is important because you, you know. You, you have to map you it out. You have to map it out. You have to map mm -hmm. out where you're going to be and places that would um, were motorcycle friendly, you know, hotels mm -hmm. that were motorcycle friendly, and also good spots to stretch your legs, stop and stretch your legs, um, or, um, yeah, grab a bite to eat. But geared more towards somebody who's wearing leather and boots mm. as opposed to, you know, right. a suit and tie. Well, motorcycle-friendly hotels are important because you don't want to just park your motorcycle hundreds and hundreds of feet from where you're staying. You want to eye on it. Exactly. That's your only ride. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice if you can find a spot that's got covered, you know, it's got, uh, that's covered or that you can park real near the, the, the hotel door because... You know, you don't have a big old suitcase to haul right. in with you. You've got to carry that stuff in with you yourself. Yeah, I so, love the dream. Yeah. Bob, we're going to pick you up one day, throw you on the okay. back of our bikes, and we're going to <laughs> go, go for a trip. How's that sound? That sounds good. I, I've, uh, I was going to buy the, the bike a friend of mine had to sell years ago, but he wouldn't sell it to me. He said, you kill yourself on a motorcycle. I saw you ride a dirt bike. Well, Amy, that's why we'll put them on back, all right? Yeah, we'll put them on the back. Instead of the chick on the back, we'll have the guy on the back. How about that? Well, well this has been a fabulous show. This has been very fun uh, interviewing you, and I've learned a lot. And Thank you. And I'll have to say this, my bucket just got bigger. Well, good. That's the idea. The longer you live, the longer your list gets. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Why? Well, thank you very much, and I hope you safeness in your travels. And I'm excited to hear more about your travels. Thank also, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're it was welcome. a pleasure, Michelle. Yes. And Bob, it's great well, to meet you too. Well, thank you, Amy. All right, we'll be right back after this. Picture a girl who could tear your whole world at the seams. Get a glimpse in her eyes and you've realized all of your dreams. Sweet as strawberry pie But then she'll make you want to cry But it's innocence that she reveals When you just look and see She's from heaven above and blood How do you explain just why everything's changed so soon Cause nothing compares to the way that she lights up the room You've thrown away all of the things Things that you thought joy would bring and nothing else matters as much anymore to you She's from heaven above She's your flesh and blood
Thank you for joining us today on APN TV Media. I'm Michelle Meyering, along with Bob Beatles, our political analyst, and Amy Eckert, who wrote 100 Things to Do in Detroit Before You Die. It's a, read, it's a definite read if you're thinking of ever coming to the city of Detroit, or if you just want to know what's going on downtown, downtown Detroit. I thank you, Amy, for joining us on thank the show. Thank you for having me in. It was a great pleasure. Yes, would, uh, would you like to say anything to our audience? Oh, uh, get out and see the world. The world is a beautiful place, whether you get around the block or um, go around the world. Get out and see the world and meet some new people. You won't be sorry you did it. And it goes to say, ride on and write on. That's right. <laughs> There's a place inside my mind unseen Dreams of you and I that just can't be But I can keep them safe and locked away inside In a perfect world where I control it Give me your heart there and I would hold it but I know that just can't be reality But please Don't you wake my daydream Cause it's so real it seems Maybe someday I'll get my head from the clouds But for now I'll just stay dream If you said to jump, then I will do it Right into the fire and walk straight through it And if you knew I bet that's just what you would say I guess the only thing for me to do is Never let you know just how I'm feeling Cause I don't want to know if you don't feel the same It's a shame Don't you wake 
with my daydream Cause it's so real it seems Maybe someday I'll get my head from the clouds But for now I'll just daydream Don't you wake my daydream 